Due to their salary cap situation, the Chargers will have to release multiple starters before the beginning of the new year, and even after his best season yet, Gerald Everett seems like one of the most likely options. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. We've been covering the Chargers now together for seven seasons, but this is our fifth season as a host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys, as always, for making us your first listen today. And to make sure you never miss the show, go subscribe to the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel and also follow the show for free on all platforms wherever you get your podcast from. And today, David, we're getting into our Fan Mail Friday and starting with a good one, talking about the most likely cuts for the Chargers with guys like Gerald Everett, Matt Filer, Dustin Hopkins, all kind of being on that list and, you know, maybe being on the wrong end of things. Gerald Everett, though, I don't know who replaces what he did for the Chargers last year for the price that you would save on him. But we know it's not Keenan Allen at this point, so the money's got to come from somewhere. And we'll also talk about if the Chargers need to double dip, not just on a receiving option, but double dipping at speed after seeing what happened to Jalen Guyton last year. We'll also talk about the downsides of potentially taking a running back in the first round and do the Chargers already have enough at that position and we'll also get into if the Chargers will really go best player available even if it doesn't fit one of their immediate needs which every team says they're going to do but becomes a lot harder to do in actuality so let's start here with the question from just so light on Twitter who asked which players are the more likely cuts to get under the cap Matt Filer, Dustin Hopkins, Gerald Everett, and the funny thing about Gerald Everett, David, is it feels like it might be a little bit surprising. Um, and I think that's situational, right? But I also think he still finds himself with, you know, the money having to come from somewhere. If they decide to go this route, he's one of the most likely options. He is. And, and I think the reason why is because, you know, although he had his best season as a pro, his numbers and what he did did not make him indif- indefensible, you know, indispensable. indispensable. Excuse yeah. me, indispensable. So, you know, that's the reason why you have to consider it. And, you know, looking at the numbers, if the Chargers decided to cut Gerald Everett, they would eat $4 million, but they would save $4.2 million against the cap. So, I mean, that's why you have to look at this uh, as a decision that the Chargers general manager, Tom Telesco, and, you know, his team is going to have to think about. Yeah, he produced very well. I mean, obviously, he wasn't, you know, a top flight elite option. He's not a fully kind of well-rounded tight end option, at least as far as he's not a dominant blocker and a dominant receiver. Right. He's a really good receiver, right, and an okay blocker, I would say. But sure, the money has to come from somewhere. I still don't think it's likely. I mean, without him, you have Donald Parham, who hasn't been able to stay healthy, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to see it. Yeah. And then you have Trey McKitty, who actually had a worse year his second year than he did his first season. And Brandon yeah. Taylor said as much when he was talking at the Combine, right? So, like, that lack of options makes it seem like it would be a surprise. Yeah. Another thing is, is you're going to have to make this decision before you draft anyone, right? You don't know if you're That's getting right. one of the top tight end options in the draft. You don't know that or by the time you're going to have to make these decisions. So, that's what makes it difficult as well. The other guys, though, Matt Filer, the Chargers would save $6.5 million. Basically a foregone conclusion at this point. I'd say he is the most likely Chargers player and a starter to get cut, right? Because these are all starters that the Chargers will have to lose potentially and have to find someone to fill that spot. Yeah. Fortunately, with this, you have Jamari Sawyer, who makes this basically not even an issue because you can save $6.5 million potentially. And projecting a little bit, put Jamari Sawyer there at left guard. If you're re-signing Trey Pipkins, right? If not, right. he's going to fill in somewhere. And even with a, a hole at left guard, if you don't re-sign Trey Pipkins and move Jamari Sawyer to right tackle, you'd still think they would try to find someone maybe for a smaller number than six and a half million. Sure. Dustin Hopkins is an interesting one, David, because the charge wouldn't save as much, but post June cut saves them $2.3 million. But it did seem like it would be hard at the end of the season to replace Cameron Dicker, who realistically would come in at a cheaper price. Oh, yeah, he definitely would uh, because, you know, he's not an NFL veteran like Dustin Hopkins is. You know, Dustin Hopkins has been in the NFL for close to 10 seasons now. So you have Cameron Dicker, who is a rookie uh, that came in and in his first game, kicked a game winner for the Chargers and then proceeded to do that all year long when he was in that situation. Almost flawless. Yeah, almost flawless. So it's kind of hard to imagine that the Chargers wouldn't make this move, go with the younger kicker, have somebody that they can keep 
on their team for many, many years to come. And I think it would be more of a cost thing than it is anyway an indictment on Dustin Hopkins. He was right. borderline perfect last year yeah. before he got hurt. And both of these guys, you know, to each kind of side a little bit, missed a kick in the Chargers' biggest game of the last two seasons. Yeah. So, like, I mean, you know, Cameron Dicker ended up missing a kick in the playoffs against the Jaguars, obviously, in the second half. That was huge. The year before that, Dustin Hopkins missed a kick during the game against the Raiders that went to overtime. We all know how that ended, right, with a tie that never was, so to speak. Ugh. So I think that it, it it sucks for Dustin Hopkins. They signed a multi-year deal to hopefully have their kicker of the future and to not have to keep his carousel of kickers going. Man, that Unfortunately, was Unfortunately, a younger, cheaper option came in and really showed he deserves to be at this level and yeah. can be, you know, counted on. I'm not going to hold the biggest, you know, kick of the season on him a guy rookie first year player having to kick two playoff field goals not an easy thing to do but i'm not going to hold that against him i'm going to use the larger sample size even if it's only about a half of a season right yeah dicker is the kicker if you can save some money there even if it seems like an insubstantial amount of money david i mean if you look at this look at it this way they would save 2.3 million dollars on that right yeah bryce callahan kyle van noy morgan fox all signed for less than that last season so even though it seems like an insubstantial amount of money, you can get veterans, you know, especially guys trying to recoup some of their value for less than what you would save on that. And obviously this is just a way to get me closer to being under the salary cap because the charges are pretty far away from it. I'd say the dark horse here, David, is Michael Davis. And I wish I wasn't, you know, convinced that the Chargers are totally ruling it out, right? Makes you feel gross even know. having to think about it, huh? It does, and Brian Staley loves corners, right? Yeah. He, he, you know, he talks about it all the time. We know that Michael Davis really was their best corner last season, but when you're talking about the easiest money to free up, he definitely checks that box, saving you know seven and a half million dollars or thereabouts, only two point four million in dead cap space, and they better not happen, especially you know with the cornerback situation. Like, I'd love to say it isn't going to happen a hundred percent, but there's just a small little piece of my mind that says it's not a hundred percent, even if it might be close to it. Right. The Chargers, I mean, it, it's not a, a for sure done deal, even as their best corner. You're right. It's not. And, you know, like we were talking before the, the show, <laughs> this is somebody who was definitely the, the best corner on the team for the Chargers. But I think the outcome that we want in regards to Michael Davis is not him being cut. It's him being extended. And, and yeah. I think that's the right answer because you can still manipulate the cap for hit for Michael Davis and get the Chargers some more cap space. And he's earned it, you know, like you just said. Um, and it was very clear and obvious. He was the best corner on the Chargers last year. He really took his assignments from the season prior, worked on that diligently, got rid of all the distractions, showed up and played his best football of his NFL career. And I think that's what you want. You want to see somebody – uh, bounce back from that adversity and be able to show you who you are. And that's what Michael Davis did. So I feel like he deserves an extension not being cut. And they could free up some money. It probably wouldn't be as much money. And it'd be interesting to see what the years on that are, because I'm sure Michael Davis would like to kind of dip into it, but sure. at least the free agency, you know, market, it's hard to say what his value would be right now based on him, not starting the whole last season, but the level of play he was playing at kind of in a weird way, like Trey Pipkins, as far as like, can you buy in on this guy on the low? Because if he does it again next season, you're not going to be able to get him for the seven and a half million you'd save now, you know, this no. year. I promise you that because no. good corners get paid. If you can tack a year onto that, move some money around, have a kind of another one year prove it for him this upcoming season. I mean, I think that's a win for everybody. Guarantees him a little bit more money in case he does kind of fall back down to earth a little bit. And the Chargers really solidify their cornerback situation with the uncertainty of J.C. Jackson. And, you know, losing Bryce Callahan potentially after his best season so far. So there's a lot kind of up in the air there. But I just wish I knew for sure. Uh, guys like Khalil Mack, it seems like that's the easiest way for them to get instantly under the cap. Seems, though, after spending a second round pick on him, now that we know they're not trying to move Keenan Allen, he would have been the next guy up as far as big money that you could just clear up in the snap of your fingers. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I mean, I just, it, it seems like it would be almost impossible. That'd be the organization the admitting defeat and admitting failure. I just don't see it happening. And it's like he's year. Brandon Staley's favorite player. Oh, yeah. Also something that should be mentioned there. <laughs> Clearly. But the draft is coming up, and that will be where the Chargers have to find a lot of the, you know, replacements for these guys. And tight end could be very high up on that list. But, should the Chargers be trying to fill needs? Is it fill needs at all cost? Or if a, you know, no doubt about a prospect gets there, but it's not at a position of need, 
Will they actually take the best player available? We're going to talk about that and talk about maybe being against Bijan Robinson at 21 for the charge. But first, I do need to tell you guys that this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. And Built Bars are the unicorn of the protein bar world. Because in the Built Bar, you're getting something that tastes great and something that's going to fit on your diet. And to me, the best part are the flavors, right? You're getting something that tastes like a churro and it fits in your diet. And you're getting a protein bar that's 100% soft and covered in chocolate and soft and easy to chew while also getting most bars at only 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, and only 4 grams of sugar. That fits on pretty much every diet, and especially with the monotony of diets, if you're getting bored with the food that you have to eat, I know when I diet, I get very bored of you know chicken and broccoli and rice and all those fun, fun flavors. Instead, get coconut puff or double chocolate or chocolate peanut butter, cookies and cream. Get something that tastes great and also fits on your diet. Break up the monotony a little bit. With Built Bar, and you can find a four four bar box at Walmart now. It's so nice to be able to go down to Walmart and get those. Or you can go to Sam's Club, get a thirteen bar box, right? Find all the best flavors, find your favorite flavor, or you can go online and save some money. Since you listen to this show, go to builtbar.com, use the promo code Lockdown fifteen, and you'll get fifteen percent off your next order. Well, that was a great question. You know, it definitely last that whole segment. I mean, we're going to see some things next week. We'll get into some kind of low. Low budget free agent options for the Chargers, too, because I mean, coupon Tom's definitely going to have to show up this year. But let's yeah. get to this next one here, David, from Justin in parentheses, very hot. If a high quality pick is available on the first, would you be opposed to them picking it up, even if it's not a team priority, like offense or defensive line, corner, safety, or would you rather make a reach at a team need or trade back? So it's a great question. And I mean, the needs will become a lot clearer. I think once you actually get to the draft and once free agency is over, it'll you know really give you an idea of what you feel like you have to get in the draft. And hopefully that's as few as positions as possible, but we don't know what free agency is going to be like this year. Cause it can't be a spending spree like it was last year. I'm taking quarterback off. <laughs> if the best player available <laughs> is a quarterback, even a generational quarterback, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with Justin Herbert. I already got one but of those. I, yep. I think for the most part, David, I mean, I could probably be talked into some different positions other than, you know, edge rusher, tight end, wide receiver, the stuff we've probably been talking mostly about. Yeah. I mean, if it's those type of positions, then, then yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I would definitely consider it just depending on who they are. But my first instinct, honestly, is to trade back. I just feel like there, there's some depth in this draft at some positions of need, you know, that you need to look at, like tight end, like edge rusher. I mean, th- those yeah. are, I mean, I think the more options, more abilities to take swings at that, I think would be better. I, I mean, I think every team, like you said, you know, they're going to say, hey, I'm going to take the best best player available at that position. But I just don't feel like the Chargers are in a position with the holes that they have on the roster to be able to enjoy an, an embarrassment of riches type of situation like that. I also just think there's a lot of ambiguity during this draft process. I mean, at least in this draft class so far, maybe things seem a little bit more solidified by the time the big day gets here. But at this point, I would say there's not a lot of guys you you could have the Derwin James type of slide or the Rashawn Slater type of slide or, you know, things like that that you wouldn't see. It happens every year. Guys ends up sliding. I don't think, you know, Jalen Carter is going to make it down to pick you 21 and they, that's not a position to need as much of a need or something you think they're going to fill in the first round. Maybe they go after something like that. I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, yeah, if, if, if a great offensive lineman ends up dropping to 21, I don't know if there's any sure things, but I mean, I there, know there's guys that aren't supposed to get, the, get there. Maybe you take that risk. I think you have to take the best player available, but if trading back is an option, like it is in this question, I'm trading back. I'm trying to get another top 100 pick. Yeah. And I'm trying to take as many dart throws as I can, especially since I'm not in the top 10 where I feel like I'm getting a sure thing at exactly. pick 21. So I think this next question kind of goes along with it because one of those guys that doesn't necessarily fill the biggest need would be B. John Robinson because we know they have Austin Eckler, right? It's not like it's the worst running back core in the league by any means, but still not the biggest need for the Chargers right now. Let's hear what Joe has to say about it. Hi, it's Joe from Jersey. It's been a little while since I last spoke to you guys, but... Um, I've seen a lot of fan mock drafts where a lot of people want to draft a running back. And uh, although I think Austin Eckler isn't the biggest dude in the world, I think he could handle the load with maybe some help. I don't think Kelly or Spiller got a chance to actually show what they could do. I think they were drafted for that very purpose. Uh, I disagree with those drafts that say take a running back in the first round. What is your opinion on that? Uh, I think uh, Kelly, Spiller, and Eckler are more than good, and we have some other holes to fill. What's your case? Thanks, guys. Go Bolt. 
It's a great question. I mean, we did the B. John Robinson show. Both of us said the Chargers should consider it, even if it's not the biggest need. But in theory, you're right. I mean, the Chargers have way bigger needs. Running back in the first round is not a good value. So I could see saying it, but like I just feel like there's too much we don't know about Isaiah Spiller at this point. There's too much I think we don't know about Josh Kelly, just having not got to see him for the entire season last year, to make me think, okay, well, they're totally good at that position. Even, you know, that's not saying they're not going to draft it at some point, but in the first round, I'd say, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to take a running back in the first round, generally speaking. It is hard to take a running back in the first round, generally speaking, but not when we're talking about the Chargers and Tom Telesco, because he has, uh, I mean, taking a running back in the first round with Melvin Gordon and traded he up, traded up back, to get yeah. him. So, and then also the, the Chargers, <laughs> just as an organization, also drafted Ryan Matthews, 12th overall in 2010, and obviously, you know, Danny, LaDainian Tomlinson as well, the, the GOAT running back. Sure. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, unless it's Bijan Robinson, I think you have to consider it. But outside of that, yeah, generally my philosophy is I, I feel like you can find value at that position specifically all up and down the, the draft and in undrafted free agency because we've seen numerous examples. Yeah, you can. I mean, the thing is, is you need to add explosiveness no matter where you can get it, right? And yeah. I think just labeling Bijan Robinson as a running back probably doesn't give him the full kind of spectrum of what he deserves as far as how much he can change your offense. Because if it is going to be a running back, it has to be a legitimate bona fide kind of generational prospect, a legitimate bona fide, you know, superstar in the waiting kind of a situation. Bijan Robinson has some of those qualities, and that's why I would understand it. I mean, you have other bigger needs. My, I would lean towards not going a running back there. I mean, it, there's probably going to be a player there, even if Bijan gets there, that I might like more. You know, we sure. still have to kind of let the process play out. But I think that a lot of things can be changed by a new offensive scheme with Kellen Moore, by potentially having, you know, guys like Rashawn Slater back in the lineup and just getting more out of your offensive line from a run blocking standpoint, because I don't think it was great last year. So yeah. there's a lot of reasons, I think, even if it's that room and those are the top three guys, that it should be improved regardless. But I still think you probably – can add a different kind of element to that room. And that is something that probably should be one of the priorities in this draft class. Whether it comes in round one, I wouldn't necessarily say that. But let's get to this here from Herbie Baby Goat. Great name. Assuming the Chargers draft or sign a speed threat, do you think it's smart to at least sign or draft one more deep threat on the team so the Jalen Guyton situation doesn't happen again next season? Jalen Guyton got hurt in a meaningless week three blowout in the fourth quarter against the Jacksonville Jaguars. It was terrible. But the Chargers never addressed the speed need after that, David. This seems like the most obvious answer in the world to me. Yes, 100,000% <laughs> yes, of course. You definitely need to do this. The Chargers should have done this the last three years. And another, re another reason that you have to consider this as well is because you don't know what's going to happen with DeAndre Carter. So you need to probably look at somebody who has some special teams ability, ability to return punts and return kicks. So I think that's another aspect of this that you need to consider. But absolutely. I mean, I think this is the biggest no-brainer in the world. Honestly, I think you could re-sign Jalen Guyton, and I'd be cool with that if he's yeah. not your only option. Right? If you're right. bringing in someone... Above the level of Jalen Guyton, I'd be happy with Jalen Guyton kind of being the speed backup plan because we've seen the connection with Justin Herbert. We've seen him be productive. And we don't know what he would have been last year, but it seemed like he was already kind of being underutilized under Joe Lombardi. And I oh, think yeah. if you had a different offensive mind with that speed, you could open up some other different things. So I'd be okay if Jalen Guyton was that specific person. But yes, have two guys who have at least some modicum of speed, something that's sub- four five right which is basically Please. everything the chargers have though <laughs> fastest receivers are running four five five so yeah not in a, a elite group of speed by any means get multiple guys who can kind of fill that role and, and be threats to stretch the defense and i think you yes. can do that not just in the first round there'll be other rounds you can get speed in this draft and then if you can find a speedy guy you feel good about and bring in jalen guyton there you go i, I mean i think you're that I'm much happy. closer yeah. to be having a much more well-rounded group and being deeper for that specific skill set, right? I mean, yeah. you have Keenan Allen and Mike Williams gets hurt. It's not like, you know, Jalen Guyton can come in and fill in for them. But no. speed-wise, at least you're not losing your only speed guy. And, you know, Josh Palmer can step up and, and do either of those roles to some degree. So I think that you absolutely have to do that. I think that's a great call there. But we do have some more fan mail questions that we want to get into, including would the Chargers be willing to just trade their first-round pick next year to get another first round pick in this year's draft, you know, get another impact player in earlier, trying to capitalize more on the Chargers window happening right now. And also what it would take to move up in the draft, something no one's talking about right now, to get to pick 15, 16, maybe go get a dynamic tight end. We're going to get into that coming up right after this. 
Let's start here with Bionic Superhero on Twitter who asked, would the Chargers be willing to trade next year's number one and something else to get another first round pick in this draft to get two players in the first round of this draft? So I'm not going to pretend I've looked at the 2024 draft prospects, but I have at least heard from the consensus guys this year. It's not as if this draft class is one of those where you're thinking, okay, this is a really, really good draft class. A lot of people say it's, you know, strong in certain positions, but overall isn't a great draft class or isn't a super, you know, loaded draft class up top where you felt like you needed to get back in on the game. Because the thing is, you don't know what that pick's going to be next year. And that makes it very, very tough to realize, you know, understand if you would want to give that pick up. I I don't see it happening. Yeah, I don't see it happening either. Although, when we're talking about Tom Tuglesco, he has traded up multiple times. Traded up for Manti Teo in 2013. Traded up for Jeremiah Tauchu in 2014. Traded up for Melvin Gordon in 2015. And then the I mean, most this isn't talking one, about trading up, though. This is talking about would you be willing to trade next year's first round pick to get an additional first round pick in this draft? Oh, definitely not. No, especially knowing Tom Telesco, he and the Chargers really value their picks and, and they like to take their picks. I, I don't see it happening. That's not something that I would entertain this year. Well, because, yeah, as he's saying, you know, a first-round pick and something else to get another thing. And that's another thing. It wouldn't just be your 2024 first-round draft pick. It would right. be plus something else. Yes. And it's just hard to say. I mean, hey, you're hoping next year's pick is at, like, 32, right? Obviously. Yes. So maybe it's a much Please. worse pick. Maybe <laughs> it works out for you. But I don't know if there's a player in this class not knowing what that pick would be where I'm saying, hey, I need to get back in this class. And I understand the concept. The concept is, hey, then you get – two players now for five in the next five years. And you're kind of getting two more, hopefully impact players to help you right now, as opposed to waiting till next year. But let me see what next year has to offer too. That's the other big thing. And then we know the chargers do that. But speaking of trading up, we do have someone named a tier who would be very, very interested in that. Dan. Hi, David. This is a tier. So I have a question about a draft. The chargers desperately need a different makers at the tight end position. Do you see them possibly moving up to number 16 or 15 and get that tied in? And what is the price it's going to cost to move up five spots? Let me hear you, please. This is a great question. I mean, because, you know, as Dave was talking about, I'll let him get into all the times Tom Tosca has done it. Tom Tosca has never traded back. So as much as we always say, hey, I'd rather trade back than do this, even though he kind of maybe hinted at doing it this year, I mean, I'm not going to believe it at all. But I will say, though, the more likely option is to trade up, whether it's going to be for a tight end. If I'm trading up for a tight end, I mean, I think you would have to be a Kyle Pitts level of prospect. And even that hasn't worked out, you know, probably as well as the Falcons have hoped it would through two seasons. But I like Dalton Kincaid a lot. I could definitely get behind him as the pick at 21 just because I think, you know, he could be a special receiving tight end. Michael Mayer, you could get finally that fully well-rounded tight end. But I also don't know if he's going to be special in either of those regards. As far as a contested catch guy, I could see him being special there. He had a ton of great ones. But, like, you're not getting an elite receiving option in my mind with Michael Mayer. I think the athleticism or lack thereof could catch up to him a little bit. And he's not able to, you know, get more separation at the next level because he wasn't getting a ton of it. I I don't see it, David. Even though if we're going by Tom Telesco's standards, it's more likely to trade up than it is to trade back. I'm definitely not doing it for one of these tight ends. Correct. Yes. I mean, like I was saying before, Tom Telesco has traded up four times. Manti Tayo, Jeremiah Tauchu, Melvin Gordon, and most recently, uh, Kenneth Murray. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it feels like you don't feel good about any of those. Yeah. That's no. the other thing, right? It well, yeah. Like you look back and, never, and you said it has never worked out for Tom right. Telesco. Did any of those guys make the type of impact that you were expecting them to make? Absolutely not. So, that's another reason. And also, I they just gave think him two other picks too to go up to get Melvin Gordon. They gave yes. him like I think a fourth and a fifth that year. Yes, to go get him or a fifth and a sixth oh. mm-hmm. <laughs> to move up two spots. Yeah, that that was atrocious. So I mean, that's you know just given that context, it's going to take a lot. And also, uh, there's no tight end that I've watched that is a generational type of talent, and that's what it would take for me to be interested in moving up that far to go get him. Yeah, and and this is what it would cost. Based on the Jimmy Johnson model, which might be a little bit outdated, still a point system that is respected at least and gives you an idea. To move up from where the Chargers are to 15 or 16, basically it would take their 21st pick, obviously, right? Trading up from 21. So you're giving up your 21st pick, and you'd probably have to give up your third round pick, right? So you'd have to go your first and your third. So now you're getting only two picks in the top 100 in this draft class. 
I, I don't think they yeah. I don't think they should do it by any means. No. I think that that is too steep of a price, and I just don't know if the player is going to be there. Obviously, you have to see who the player is. It's never worked out for the Chargers. It's hard for me to imagine it would work out in that situation. Let's go to Ed and Lisa's question here. And they ask, do you think with the new OC, because I don't know if it is Ed or Lisa, so I'm, I'm giving it to both of them. Yes. The new OC, with the new OC, Staley will let the starters play in some preseason games. This one's a quick one for me. No, because they've, you know, they, first, they already had Joe Lombardi. That's the big thing, right? Joe Lombardi was a first-year coordinator. If they didn't feel like they needed to do it then, I don't see them doing it now. No, they're not going to do it just because Brandon Staley has already made it very clear. If I already know who you are and what you can do, I have no reason to evaluate you, which means I have no reason to play you in the preseason. So that's not going to happen. It also keeps my dream alive that Justin Herbert could be like one of the only quarterbacks ever that's to like never. that caliber, <laughs> to, caliber to never play in any preseason because yeah. 2020 <laughs> preseason got canceled. Probably yeah. would have played or would have for sure played Tyler oh, Taylor as the starter yeah. at that point. He may never play in one. And if, yeah. if he does play in one, it would take a new head coach based on what Brandon Staley has shown his philosophy is. Then again, Brandon Staley played Justin Herbert with a hurt shoulder in the last game of the season and got Mike Williams hurt. So never say never, but hopefully we don't see as many boneheaded decisions like that going forward. That's something he's already shown. So let's get to this one from Brandon Mitchell here who asks, do you think Brandon Staley goes for it more on fourth down this upcoming season now that Kellen Moore is the new offensive coordinator? What do you think? I'm going to say yes, and and I think it's because of some comments that I saw recently, especially uh, from his old head, head coach, Mike McCarthy. He basically said that Kellen Moore wants to light up the scoreboard, and he wanted to run the ball and, and keep his defense rested a little bit more. So just given that information, that makes me feel like, absolutely, he's going to want to go to Brandon Staley and be like, hey, we can go get this. We're going to stay on the field. We're going to keep this thing rolling. So yes, I definitely feel like it's going to mean them going for it on fourth down more often. Yeah, and that's why I don't think you can use, you know, the Cowboys and where they rank just because, like, Mike McCarthy is super risk-averse. I mean, they, they yes. ranked 21st in the amount of fourth downs they went for last year in the league. Chargers were still, even in a less aggressive year, like top seven as yeah. far as how many times they went for it on fourth down. And it can be a little bit of a misleading stat, right? a stat because, like, if you're a bad team and you're in desperate situations, you're going to have to go for it on fourth down more. Yeah. The nice thing was is when they did go for it last year, the Cowboys converted it at the fifth highest percentage. So I like that because obviously that means, hey, when they had to do it, Kellen Moore was dialing up the right plays when those big situations called, right? So that's what yeah. I like to see. I could definitely see it. It seems like they're more in sync as far as the aggressiveness goes, and it never really struck me that Joe Lombardi was someone who was going to go out there and be super vocal about, hey, we need to go do this. We need to be more aggressive. We need to go for this fourth down. Maybe Kellen Moore feels more passionately and says, hey, I got the play for this. Yeah. You know, let me do it, you know, kind of yeah. thing. And, and trust Justin Herbert more, and we can see – them going for it in more of those, you know, situations where it's not as obvious. This year, right. they went for it a lot on fourth down, but it was mostly obvious kind of situations. I'd like Definitely. to see them lean more towards the brain and stay with 2021 right. Not as model. risky, right? Yeah. I'd rather them be more risky. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd rather them, do, you know, do it when it's, when it's obvious, you know, by the numbers, hey, you should go for this now, even if it's not, you know, the old school way the NFL usually does it. Let's get right. one more voicemail in here and try to get as many questions in here as we possibly can. This is a funny one. And a fun one. Let's hear what we have. This is Chris Gocko Sr. from Folsom, California. Just wanted to say that this is the best Chargers podcast out there. My question is, what do you think about using Xander Horvath kind of like the way that the Buccaneers used Mike Allstott back in the early 2000s? Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Go Bulls. Uh, we get a lot of questions about Xander Horvath. The, my yeah, we do. issue is, <laughs> is Kellen Moore didn't use – you know, fullbacks in a traditional sense last year. It was a lot of tight yeah. ends. And when it wasn't tight ends, it was their guard, Connor McGovern. Who right. was yeah, the there, extra right? offensive so like, lineman. Yeah. They didn't have a full-blown fullback, and they haven't really under Kellen Moore. So that that's what would stop me from doing this. But let's not take the fun out of this because Mike Allstott is one of the funnest. Look up Mike Allstott highlights if you've never seen him before, the youngins out there. He actually shared a backfield with Lorenzo Neal. And for those who don't know, newer Charger fans, Lorenzo Neal was the dude you didn't want to mess around with, and he always led the way for LaDainian Tomlinson, one of the best fullbacks in the NFL, in NFL history, for my money, and it's probably unbiased. I love him. Lorenzo Neal was was the man. I mean, he is just a, a pure glass eater from a different time, and I think that's hard, David. I mean, Xander Horvath, if you want to talk about getting more carries, I get it. The dude was an athletic freak. He yep. ranked on his RAS score as, like, the most athletic fullback of all time. And yep. also one of the most athletic running backs of all time. But the numbers he put up last year, uh, I just, 
I worry about Xander Horvath's spot on the roster this year. Yeah. Uh, if not, though, if you could find a way to tap into that athleticism, maybe Kellen Moore takes that project under his wing. He's big. He's strong. He's nowhere near as strong as Mike Allstott. That dude was a tornado with the ball in his hands and just bowled over people like nobody's business. They don't make yeah. players like that anymore. Maybe there's a couple, you know, Derrick Henry breaks tackles kind of like that. Like yeah. Nick Chubb can break tackles. Those really, really strong guys. They don't make them like Mike Allstott in the, you know, in the 2020s. That's a from a yesteryear for sure, even though a lot of fun to think about. Mike Allstott was like Stone Cold Steve Austin in the longest yard. You give him the ball, he's going to run through everybody in front of him. And also, let's consider the differences here, too. Mike Allstott was 6'1", 250 plus. Um, he was a gigantic man, like yeah. literally a, a house. Xander Horbath is, is tall, but he's only about 230, 235. So there's a big difference in size between those two guys. I mean, would I like to see him get more opportunities? Sure. I mean, he showed in the beginning of the year that he can get in the end zone. He scored a couple of touchdowns, and then he just kind of evaporated. good in short-yarded situations for the most part, too. Yes, exactly. I mean, he he was doing th some things for your offense, but then he just evaporated, and it was never really used for the majority of the season. So, I mean, I'd like to see him used more in that same kind of vein. I don't yeah. know if he's built for, for that role. Yeah, and I mean, you just don't see power backs as much anymore. I know everyone right. wants that short yardage guy. They just don't exist as much anymore because teams don't put as much of a value, I think, on just, you know, being able to get one yard and things like that. They think they can get it another place. And it's a numbers game, too. No matter how big of a running back you are, teams are selling out to stop you and they just get the numbers on you and the numbers advantage on you. It's hard for guys like that, you know, to exist. They don't make Peyton Hillis anymore. They don't make Brandon Jacobs anymore, right? Right. It's just it's a it's a it's a dying breed, I would say. So <laughs> I'd like to see him potentially get more carries. I'd like to see someone try to tap into that, you know, athleticism that he has. Pretty decent receiver too. hurdled a ton of dudes in college. We'll see what happens. But that is going to wrap things up for today's show. Thank you to everyone who hit us up at Lockdown LAC on Twitter and gave us your questions and anyone who called into the voicemail line at three, two, three, five, two, four, seven, nine, two, four. We appreciate you guys. And we will be back with you guys, as always, on Monday going to do mock draft monday maybe we'll do first and second round maybe we'll do more defensive players since it seems like the nolan smith dreams may have died at the combine today him a defensive end running a four three nine officially and also you know being as good of a run defender as he was at 239 pounds what he checked in at, at the combine so uh, we might have to talk about some other guys maybe bj ojalari maybe we get into some defensive tackles someone like elijah Cancy. some some really fun options maybe we'll go first and second round we will be back with you guys, though, for Mock Draft Monday for sure. Make sure you don't miss the show, though. Make sure you're following us on all podcast platforms, wherever you get your podcasts from, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever. And make sure you're also subscribing to the Locked on Chargers YouTube channel. You can also find the show every day on our personal social media. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogmeyer on Twitter at DrotalkSD. And his DMs are always open. You can also find the show on our Locked on Chargers Facebook page and at Locked on Chargers on Instagram. Thank you guys again for making this your first listen. If you need a second listen, make sure to check out the Locked On NFL Draft Show with Damian Parson and Keith Sanchez providing in-depth coverage of the biggest NFL draft prospects with deep dives into the sleepers and hidden gems that can change your favorite NFL franchise. And you can find that wherever you get your podcast from on YouTube. Make sure you guys are back here on Monday, though, for Mock Draft Monday, another version of that. But until then, take it easy and go Bolts.